Hello, I'm Sam Elkins. And I'm Gus Davis. Welcome to TMN Television on Thursday, November 21st. Tonight, we take a look at the recent International Week program. We also check out the last installment of our show, Kirksville Creeps. And don't forget to stay tuned for our Truman Sports Update. These stories and more on TMN Television. You don't want to miss this. Truman State University Food Pack program is a service on campus that helps students who are struggling to make ends meet or experiencing food insecurity. They can go to the Serve Center and receive packs of food. The program is run out of the Serve Center with a committee of comprised of students, faculty, and staff. The Food Pack program began as a class project of Casey, Casey Cooks, which she then took to J.D. Smyzer, Director of the Office of Citizenship and Community Standards. Together, they developed a plan to address food insecurity on campus. Brian Ott, Assistant Professor of Sociology and Food Pack Committee member, says the committee spoke with people from the pantry for Adair County, and they helped us in organizing the idea of the Food Pack program. The packs are able to feed one person for a day or two with a vegetarian option available. This service is open to any student who brings their student ID to the Serve Center, and it's located on the first floor of the Student Union Building. All food packs given out are logged, and the information is given to the pantry for Adair County to report how many people are in the community they are serving since the food comes from them. Molly Lamzik, Serve Center worker, says they are able to give out two food packs a month to a student and only one per week. They offer a third and fourth emergency food pack to students who are in need of them. They have them fill out a small form and then approve it to give them the extra packs. The ultimate goal is to have a food pantry on campus and possibly expand that service to other basic necessities. The Center for International Students at Truman celebrated International Education Week with a variety of events. Here, t here is TMN-TV's reporter Anas Alhassani with the story. Here at the Center for International Students, our job is to help support international students, whether it's with immigration, personal life, or academic life. And as the student support intern, my role is to help coordinate all the student workers here. So we had a variety of events this year. On Sunday we had our night market, which involved food from all over the world, from different countries. And then on Monday we had a board game night where we just had different board games from different countries. On Tuesday we had international tea and coffee, which involved performances by different students here on campus and people talking about their study abroad experiences. And then on Thursday we had a careers around the world presentation with the Career Center, where they talked about how you can look for internships and jobs overseas. And then on Friday, we had a language crash course where some of our student workers who are international students here, they kind of explained a little bit about their language. Noisy construction in Violet, Violet Hall has been interrupting some Truman instructors. The construction to replace the chiller unit in Violet's basement began in late October, a few months after similar construction in the student union building. Dave Rector, Vice President for Administration, Finance, and Planning, says the Violet Hall construction was postponed until October instead of the end of summer because if there had been problems, there might not have been any air conditioning when the students returned. The Academic Affairs Office was tasked with notifying Hall, Violet Hall instructors of the construction. However, some instructors did not find out about the impending noise until they were already teaching. Several classes relocated to other rooms around Violet Hall to escape the sounds of jackhammers, drilling, and sawing. According to Dave Rector, the construction is nearing an end and should be finished in about a week or so. More people are using the university counseling services, which has caused the program to make adjustments in order to accommodate students. Counselor Joe Hamilton says September had the highest number of first-time students coming to use the services in the history of UCS. Hamilton says UCS has a record number of appointments in October, totaling at 603. Hamilton says because of this increase, it is difficult for staff members to juggle administrative responsibilities and student needs. Brenda Higgins, director of UCS and Student Health Services, attributes the rise in utilization to the reduced stigma of mental health issues. Higgins says more students who are coming to UCS already had mental health care before and they are wanting to continue the kind of care they previously received. Hamilton says UCS is in the process of hiring a psychologist who would work part-time at Truman and part-time at A.T. Still University. 
A job posting went out in September for this position, but UCS has yet to see any applicants. Higgins says if UCS cannot find a new staff member to accommodate the high volume of students, they will have to look at their current model and make adjustments. The Ozarks Area Community Action Corporation of Springfield will host their first annual Mac and Cheese Festival on Saturday. The event will feature seven restaurants that will provide samples for attendees. Each attendee will have a chance to vote for their favorite sample, and in addition there will be a mac and cheese bar with a variety of toppings, as well as dessert. There will also be a macaroni a craft area for kids, a DJ, photo booth, and drawing for prizes. Tickets are $15 in advance and $20 at the door. Organizers say they have already sold most of the tickets and they expect to sell out before Saturday. The event will be held at the Relics Event Center in Springfield, Missouri. Proceeds from the event will support OACAC's efforts to fight poverty in the Ozarks and surrounding areas. Next up, we have our Truman weather forecast. Stay tuned after the break for our Truman Sports Update. Never forget the day our landlord called and said, read your lease. No pets allowed. My owner tells him my dog ate the lease, but that didn't work. And now I'm stuck in a shelter. But this pit bull is ready for a new crib. I'm loving, loyal, and play well with others. So don't be intimidated by all my muscles, because the biggest one I have is my heart. <laughs> That's right, I said it. Truman's volleyball teams played Friday and Saturday and won both matches. On Friday, they played the McKendry University Bearcats and won all three sets. During the first set, Jocelyn Livingston came in with a kill and two, two more points tied the set. Truman finally got ahead of the Bearcats and won 31-29. to This was the Bulldogs' longest set of the season. After the first set, the Bulldogs had an early lead of 8-3 to in the second. At one point, McKendry was only two points behind Truman, but the second set ended with a score of 25 to 17. For the entire last set, the Bulldogs kept the lead and finished with 25 to 19. Saturday was the Bulldogs' senior day and final game of the season against Southern Indiana. The Bulldogs did not make it to the GLVC tournament, however, they did ruin Southern Indiana's chance by winning three of the four sets against them. The first set was one of the best Truman played the whole season by starting out with a 9 to 2 advantage continued to lead the entire set and had no attack errors. The second set was similar, but the Screaming Eagles came as close as two points behind. During the third set, the Screaming Eagles took the win with a score of 25 to 20. The final set was 20 to 16. The Bulldogs lost five seniors, but have returning talent for the next season. Five Truman women's soccer players earned a spot on the All Great Lakes Valley team. It was announced by the league office on Thursday night. Senior midfield Hannah Burke was a first team selection. Junior forward Chance Douglas earned second team honors. Senior Isabel Kurzban, Leah Bolskar, and Paige Peterson were third team choice. Additionally, Hannah Liljegren was team representative on the 2019 James R. Spaulding sportsmanship list. The Bulldogs finished this season with 10 wins, 7 losses, and 1 tie. They were 10 to 5 in the GLVC. This placed them fourth in the conference postseason tournament. The Bulldogs won eight of their last nine regular season games. Truman's football team finished their season with a winning record of 9 to 2. They will represent the GLVC at the inaugural America's Crossroads Bowl on December 7th in Hobart, Indiana. Join reporter Shane Anspa as she interviews football's head coach, Greg Nesbitt. Uh, we're eight wins and one loss. Uh, I think there's 17 teams, Shane, in our school's history. We've had over 110 seasons that have won, uh, won eight. If we can uh, win one more, we'll be one of six. So competitively going very, very well. That early on in terms of winning and losing again, just from that pers aspect, uh, this team gained some early season confidence, particularly with uh, our season opening win at Drake, an FCS program, uh, in our first game of the year, and half the battle in teaching or coaching, particularly guys, is, is uh, 
they start thinking they're good, and, and uh, we kind of roll from there. It's this is uh, I call it an eclectic group. We've got to 18 seniors, so we've got some wily old veterans, and we also have 10 freshmen that we pulled your red shirt that are currently playing in a class of uh, probably mid 20s in terms of incoming freshmen. So they've impacted this season greatly, and not just the ones that are crossing the white lines and playing on game day that we pull the red shirts, uh, all of them are doing a very good job. We've led the GLBC, uh, gosh, we've been in this league, Shane, I think this is our seventh year. So through the last six, uh, we've had the most all-conference all academic performers. you got to carry a 3-3 for a calendar year, mm -hmm. and not just by a little bit, by a bunch. Um, we've won four consecutive sportsmanship trophies, voted on by the head coaches. So. Uh, in recent history, our kids have uh, done extremely well in the classroom. Uh, they've won and lost with class uh, on the field, so they've represented the university very well. Right now, we're in the hunt. Uh, there's uh, four teams that have advanced to NCAA Division II national playoffs in our school's history. If we can win out, we're going to have an opportunity to do that. Uh, we're still trying to compete for a conference championship. Uh, we won one. The last we won was 2016. We currently have 27, so there's still, uh, even though we only have two regular season games left, there's, there's a lot on the table for, for this current team. This has been your Truman Sports Update. Be sure to stay tuned after the break for Kirksville Creeps and Real People. Families come in all sizes and shapes. Sometimes your friends are your family by choice. Or sometimes you're just stuck with Uncle Charles. But what we know is that you want to protect the people that are close to you. But the flu can unravel everything. Your flu vaccine protects you and your family. No matter what draws your family together, protect yourself. Protect your family. Everyone needs a flu vaccine. We are ending our ongoing investigation into the creepy happenings in town. Join reporter Katie Varner as she investigates the paranormal for one last time in the new installment of Kirksville Creeps. Join us as we explore the dark, the strange, and the unexplained. Join us as we hear the unsettling tales of encounters with the unknown, and the truth behind Kirksville's most hair-raising destinations. Join us for Kirksville Creeps. A Truman student, who preferred to be unnamed, shared their knowledge of a grisly murder that occurred just a few miles away from Kirksville. The student writes, There is a spot right out of town where an old man died. He was a grumpy dude that used to flash cash all around town. One night, a group of five or six kids, ages 17 to 21, broke into his house to rob him. They tied him to a bed and tortured him to find out where he kept his safe. They got the money and then burned the house down with him inside, alive. We discussed this student story with Randy Bame, who is familiar with this uncommon Kirksville legend. Yeah, that was all true from the research that uh, I've done with it and we did for the film that we made about it. Randy showed us an article that was published by the Southeast Missourian in 2002, a few months after the murder of Frank B. Schimmick in the small, now long abandoned town of Goldsbury. Strangely, the majority of the article was of Goldsberry locals complaining about Frank Schimmick rather than the details of his murder. In life, Schimmick was strongly disliked by his neighbors, one of whom described him as the meanest, most unhappy man. The article was also vague about the details of Schimmick's death, claiming he was fatally shot before the fire was set to his home. Yeah, I, I, there's some definitely some conflict there, but it also in that original article it it does um, suggest that it was something more than that. When they say no matter what kind of person he was, no one should die that way, so it it certainly suggests it was more than just being shot, uh, which made it you know a really gruesome kind of crime. Just down the road from the location of Frank Schimmick's brutal murder is a cluster of abandoned Goldsberry homes. Due to a fallen tree, the most striking and mysterious of these was too dangerous for our reporters to investigate. Randy, however, has already been inside. Well, I've been there many times, is what i got to tell you. So, I mean, the first time I discovered the place was uh, a lot of years ago. I want to say it was probably about 2009, 
somewhere in there, and went into the big two-story house, the first one. It was nighttime. I had seen the other ones as we were coming down the road, all right? So what it was is we'd been to dinner in Macon at the Pear Tree, and we were coming back down the uh, side roads and stuff, and as we're going along on this highway, I look over to the side, I just happen to notice this, oh, there's an abandoned house, and I love abandoned houses, exploring them. And then immediately, then there was another one, I'm thinking, oh, wow. And then immediately there was another one, I'm thinking, oh, this is just too much. And then right across the street was this big two-story house just looming out of nowhere. I thought, okay, that's it, i got to stop right now. And so explored that one with the intention of coming back and exploring the others. And when I did that, that's when I, I discovered that there was even more houses than I thought, and then made the realization that this was actually a town because the street or the, the, the city limit signs were still there. And oddly enough, they didn't look old at all. They looked rather new. And so this then intrigued me. So uh, I told some friends about it, and we started exploring. In the process of this, I found some pretty cool stuff that I've collected over the years. I collect mason jars. There is one of the houses that does have a bunch of jars with stuff still in it, which is really looks gross, and I couldn't even begin to tell you where it is. But the house housed about a dozen or so hospital beds. So when I first saw this, I was thinking, okay, this was an old house at one time, but then there were clear signs, very recent signs at that time of a renovation happening. And then if you look in where the room where you go in to the side of the house, the first one, there was a very long stainless steel sink um, that was there at the time when I was there. So it made me think that this was kind of at one time a convalescent home or something like that. It's where old folks would probably go, you know, or sick people, a place to go to kind of nice. <laughs> That's what I thought. But then I found out that it was not, in fact, something like that, that the guy who had owned the house, for reasons that nobody really knew, had purchased all of these hospital beds and stored them there. And it seemed, but it seemed very bizarre, because there was, uh, at that time, there must have been at least three or four on the front porch, two in the living room, two in the other living area parlor, let's call it, where there was and may still be an old player piano. Um, but it just, it still seemed like it was probably a convalescent home or something like that. But very, very little information I've been able to find through the years about Goldsbury and why and what happened. But the one thing is for sure, with the exception of about one house, all the others, they just left everything and left. And pretty bizarre. If we go into all the different houses, the one thing that is consistent you will find is that any piece of mail that was left behind, any magazine, the final dates seem to be around 95. And then all of a sudden it's gone. Join us next time on Kirksville Creeps as we explore more of the strange abandoned sites just outside of Truman. Tonight we take a look at the new installment of our recurring series, Real People, with me, Sam Elkins. This week's film is Ford v. Ferrari. Hello and welcome back to this week's episode of Real People. This is episode 8, Ford v. Ferrari Review. I'm the host, Sam Elkins, and I'm joined today by two guests. Two guests, very exciting. This is Michael Moore and Jeremy Fink. Welcome back. If you it's remember me. from IT Chapter 2, the very first episode, so we got a veteran. Uh, this week we're talking, like I said, about Ford v. Ferrari. If you haven't seen the film, this is a spoiler-free review, so feel free to continue. All right, so right off the bat, initial thoughts. What did you all think? I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it so much. Just like I, I pride myself on being such like a car nerd. Mm -hmm. I'm like in the grand scheme of things, and like other car people, I'm such like like a casual. But like I just like all the cars and stuff. It spoke to my soul. I told Jeremy and I, basically everybody else that like the whole time I was in the theater, I like held back happy tears mm -hmm. like through mm -hmm. the entire thing. I yeah. Yeah. Um, it wasn't as much to an extent as that I'm not familiar with cars, obviously, um, but 
Um, I had a great time with the movie. I really enjoyed it. I didn't realize it was um, James Mangold who made the film until yeah. I was sitting there. And yeah. It's a, a James Mangold film, and I got really excited. Yes. Um, but I enjoyed it way more than I thought I would, yes. so that was great for me. Yes. For those of you who don't know, James Mangold is the, uh, in my opinion, underrated director. Uh, he directed Logan and also co-wrote Logan. But yeah, so 4V Ferrari, a film, Matt Damon and Christian Bale, two A-listers coming in. It, it, for me, at first, just from the trailers, like I was, I wasn't not excited for it. Like I heard the reviews, that it was like really good and everything. But like I was like, okay, it looks like, it looks like a Matt Damon film, right. you know. Yeah. And like Matt Damon hasn't done a ton, a ton of great films recently, at least. <laughs> that was what I talked to Michael and Meg about when we left the theaters. I was like, I forgot that like Matt Damon could act. Yeah. Um, because the last thing I'd seen of him was his cameo in Thor Ragnarok. Yeah. <laughs> so like seeing him like like his role in the film was really yeah. good. He did a good job. Yeah. But uh, what are some like specific things that you guys really enjoyed about it? Um, for sure, just like the racing sequences were just like really good. Like they they were cut like pretty often. Like there were a bunch of different views, but I never felt like you were like jumping around. You know, like how like in Interstellar, like it seemed like every shot was like a vine kind of thing, mm -hmm. and like it was all like jumping around. But like in this, like there's a lot of like shots that kind of carry through a lot of like on the hood kind of shots mm -hmm. so you get like that motion and just like I think just the theater made it a whole lot better just like being engrossed in that like engine sound it was almost like you're sitting like on top of the engine yeah kind of on the car and you could like feel every vibration like it was yeah mm -hmm. I think for me one of my favorite parts is always going to be characters and how they interact with each other mm -hmm. yeah. I think um Matt Damon and Christian Bale's characters and their relationship in the film is really great. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed, you know, maintaining their own individual characteristics and how, like, um, Ken, Christian Bale's character was more of, like, a combative. Um, mm -hmm. And just that beginning scene where we first meet them and are presented with their relationship and the whole wrench throwing and the yelling and the smashing. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah. Oh, this is going to be, it's a great way. Not only did it establish it, but it made it enjoyable mm -hmm. and reaffirmed that it would be enjoyable throughout the film. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And they really stayed true to their characters yeah. throughout the film without taking away from the de their development of characters, yeah. too. So it was a really funny film. Yeah. Yeah. And I was kind of... So I was one of the only people in the film, in, or in the film. I was, no. I was in it. I was a one-man show. No. <laughs> I was one of the only people in the theater going to see it. I went by myself, and then there was like this kind of elderly couple nearby who stayed silent the entire film. And I was like cracking up at, po at moments. I'm like, is this not funny? Am I going crazy? But I was like, no, it's funny. They're just not laughing. But yeah, no, I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, those character interactions... And then even like the drama, like the you know the conflict with uh, f between Ford and Ken, yeah, um, yeah. The conflict between Ford and Ferrari is a lot more nuanced than you'd think from a film called literally Ford v Ferrari. Ferrari. Yeah, these actors like took their their characters and they made them like they like fell into the roles and made it their own too. Right, yeah. Were there any things that you maybe didn't like or maybe you thought could have been improved about the film? They always have with a lot of these films. Um, could always be like the female characters and their That's, roles in it, because yeah. um, they often are um, placed into a role of like the household wife, and mm -hmm. um, and obviously they give her some moments like that car scene, which is yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, but by the end of the film, she is the woman sitting at home supporting her husband and cheering for him. Yes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And that's always. Like a bummer. Overall, like I thought it was a very exciting film, very fun. Uh, if you're if if you're looking for good drama, see it. If you're looking for entertainment, see it. If you're looking for cars, see it. Yeah. All right. So thank you guys so much for watching. This has been episode eight of Real People Ford v Ferrari review. I've been Sam Elkins, and this these have been my lovely guests, Michael Moore, Jeremy Fink. If you'd like to check out the full spoilery review of this episode, check that out on TMN Television's YouTube page. Um, so, thanks for watching. Thank you for tuning in with us tonight. For complete news coverage, be sure to stay tuned to KTRM, pick up a copy of The Index, and look at Detours Magazine's latest adventure online. Don't forget to also check out our news content on tmn.truman.edu. You can also follow TMN on Facebook and Twitter for breaking news updates. And if you missed part of our broadcast tonight, check out TMN TV on YouTube. If you've ever thought about being on TV, be sure to head on over to tmn.truman.edu slash apply to fill out an application today. From all of us here at TMN, thank you for tuning in and have a great Thanksgiving break.